I have within my possession an archive of digital narratives comprising of space naval log journals bundled together by ancestors of the Valdegrath family, those of my great-great-grandfather Alderon Valdegrath, who was a commander in the Martian military reconnaissance vessel, Alexander IV. The computer boards are fused together into one metallic volume labeled Books of Light, The Journeys. I have come to hold deep consternation in regards to one particular account in these annals and feel the call of posterity to present this journal to the Department of Disease Control. The accounts which I refer to and which are sub-labeled A New Paradise in Triangulum refer to the primary mission of the Alexander Afoy spacecraft when it landed on Gamor 5, a Type Q inhabited planet in the Triangulum Galaxy, for the first instance of human habitation in this region. I will allow the Elder Majestics of the Great Martian Republic to make their own judgment on the notes. Then I will share my final fears on the matter at the end of the excerpt. Valdegrath Journal, 329 megapascals, star pattern V2ZX, fraction 1. The departure of the N-Class fleet of reconnaissance vehicles for Triangulum Galaxy Taking off from Dorita Launch Facility in Upper Mars on Sol, 289, 328 megapascals was a project long in development. The Republic has had long expectations for such a journey, and despite much anxiety over the probability of success or failure in our enterprise, the voyage of the Alexander I, Alexander II, Alexander III, Napoleon II, and Washington Mai have all clocked successful passageway to their destinations. The Alexander Firm 4 touched down on Gamor 5 at Resonance 31. We were greeted with reasonably inhospitable weather conditions, however early detections of floral, quinetic, and animal life has proved accurate. The 672-strong crew of the Alexander 4 were quick to test the atmospheric conditions, and we had constructed a temporary dome shelter after about two-quarter sole. The shelter was 20 jets by 20 jets, and technicians quickly assembled the data storage devices, so our consolidary baggage could all be logged and backed up. On fraction two of our time spent on Gamor 5, a rough estimate of a day we have begun measuring by utilizing angle relationships of Gamor 5's mother planet and its two suns, we were moving rapidly. Everyone was keen to escape the confines of the temporary dome, which seemed to keep in check the odd weather conditions, but was not in itself sufficient to deflect the immense light and heat from the planet's glowing suns. The mossy terrain was also odorous and not ideal for sleeping near. A 200 or so construction team quickly set to work, building more fortified constructions and oxidizing facilities, which would eventually become fully functional Martian terraces. The view of the various teams at work, drilling and scorching in the odd glare of this fungus-covered purple and green world, was quite serene, and one felt the sense of pride and inspiration that comes only with the knowledge of Martian achievement. I abandoned the thought for too much idle wonder can sully the mind of a dedicated soldier whose life is one of toil and work. We had detected life on Gamor 5 as far out as the Nereem star, and were very keen to explore and discover what new species we might encounter. Thus far, the familiar growth common in this region, the moss-like photosynthetic organism which seems to spread via meteorites across the Triangulum Galaxy, is all we have recorded in our species journal amidst the Books of Light. Valdegrath Journal, 329 megapascals, star pattern V2ZX, fraction 4. Some news of the Alexander I and Alexander II, our supply ships, they are reportedly no less than five fractions from landing. Whilst the destroyers Napoleon and Washington are currently surveying the circumference of the planet and have reported evidence of a semi-intelligent species living on the same continent we have set down on the soil of. Latitude and longitude coordinates of the outposts of these creatures are being transferred to our data centers as I record. The Napoleon should land in an hour's time, deploying troops and amiable search parties of which I am to join with one commander Hans Eschivach. 
in order that we make our first communication with the unknown life form. Provisions are being unpacked, and there is to be a celebratory feast held in honor of the local species the moment first contact is made. Word is still being held whether we will call to deploy another fleet from Mars, as this looks like one of the most promising attempts to discover life as an equal to mankind. Valdegrath Journal, 329 megapascals, star pattern V2ZX, fraction 18. Our cultivation of the terrain is still in its infancy, however we can now boast of an entire district of Martian terraces and an extended system of domes. Commander Eshevar has established an outpost as far as the Eshevar mountain range, as it has been arrogantly named. The three major encampments, about eight Kanajets in varying directions, are capable of sleeping 300 soldiers at a time. An unfortunate but necessary fortification barrier. The life form on this planet has turned out to be, how should I say this, not exactly man's equal. There is indeed a second fleet on its way to us, four supply vessels and four destroyers. There is no immediate danger. However, duty calls us to put our full efforts into this endeavor. The Alexander Secu is currently en route to redock at the Triangulum Martian Supply Center. The soil around the Eshevach Ranges has proved to be fertile to some Martian floral species, to great jubilation from the crew. Tuk-tuk seeds and lion plants have already proved harvestable, and we will most likely be able to create a self-sufficient food supply chain by approximately 70 sol which is 103.2 fractions by our current measure of time. We have also encountered numerous species of native vegetation, though these purple thistled vines have proven mostly unsuitable for consumption. A full survey of the planet has shown there to be three continents surrounded by the misty gaseous methane sea. However, two of those continents are unusually cold and fog covered ultimately uninhabited and uninhabitable. The dominant species of the planet only appear to be scattered around this continent, which has been called Infantamara by the Surveyor General, the natives themselves being largely incommunable in this regard. They are a semi-erect bipedal creature whose face can only be said to resemble an Earth terrestrial pig, though they are quite pale and, it must be said, have a certain brutish muscular frame. The estimated population of these pig beings is currently at several hundred thousand, based on aerial surveillance. Little complementary description could be given to the creature's character. They are a vastly inferior species to man, comparable, perhaps, only to our pre-evolutionary ancestors of planet Earth. No more gifted of intellect than, say, Neanderthal, their facial expression, Wide faces and bulbous eyeballs convey an utter stupidity of mental calculation. To put it simply, the pig degenerates, who our scientists estimate have occupied Gamor 5 for countless millennia, have not reached high on the evolutionary ladder. They have yet to even gather in tribes or set the foundations of early civilization. Their food cultivation certainly could not be categorized as farming-centric, being extremely primitive. They catch the large flying insects common to the region, with weaponry carved from a rare green cave crystal, which we have yet to analyze, but could prove to be the only precious commodity on the planet. Other than these sharpened crystals and metallic pitchforks, which the creatures don't seem to have created themselves, they have barely any artistic skill or tools beyond the basic necessities of hunting and survival. When we first tried to introduce ourselves to the pigmen, they were utterly enamored by our landing craft, and raising their pitchforks in the air and grunting, they seemed to be experiencing the ecstasy of revelation. We presented them with various gifts, for which they had little use of other than devouring the food offerings with gluttony, gulping Voss fish down their hideous throats. After several failed attempts at communication, a few of the pig beings became unruly, and our soldiers were forced to restrain and in some cases terminate the more violent natives. Since then, we have tried to sterilize them with overhead drug and chemical sprays, although chaos still tends to break out at the boundaries of our current fortifications. Thus far, 
The subtotal we have killed amounts to little more than a few hundred, and we have made use of the dead bodies, conducting scientific autopsies. We have found their biology marginally similar to Earth and Martian mammals, but their bone tissue is more plant-like in matter. On more than one occasion, the brutish fiends have gone into an extreme fit of rage when we removed their compatriots' bodies for analysis, as they do at least seem to have their own funereal and burial customs, which we intend to document and explore over the next several fractions. The most fortunate aspect of the pig savages is that they seem to loathe toil and collective action, favoring inaction and sloth. This makes conquest inevitable, but as they shun learning or knowledge and adoption of manners, they stand little chance of us developing complex interspecies relationships any more than we may hope to communicate with insects. Even the simian species whom man has spent millennia evolving alongside have shown aptitude for developing our customs. These Gamoran pigs are as likely to achieve complex communication than is the bumblebee. We have attempted to engage them with our own holographic art, but their feeble minds can only interpret the visions as shamanistic warnings, activating their superstitious defenses. They have no understanding of our technology, except perhaps when they view collections of weaponry, at which time they become ecstatic, grunting and waving their pitchforks in the air. Dr. Hersai has a theory that the planet has been previously visited by a more intelligent species, as aerial surveillance has shown evidence of more advanced structures in the southern regions. This theory would also explain how the degenerate pig beings got their hands on the pitchforks, as they are certainly beyond the capacity of their own invention, creatures who have yet to master the art of clothing, more than crude skirts made of plastic-like vegetation. Valdegrath Journal, 329 megapascals, star pattern V2ZX, fraction 32. Returning to the subject of a previous entry, we have been observing the pigmen and their funereal customs. They do indeed have a sort of graveyard east of our encampment. This is little more than the most primitive burial chamber, with square holes of earth carved out and monoliths of the green cave crystal used as headstone markers. Around the site of the graveyard, there are also some other primitive structures, including ziggurats, and a kind of idol or shrine of some form. After observing the creatures bury their dead and kneel before their shrine, we can now appreciate that their primitive brains, at least, have come so far as to produce the basic escarpments of religion. As we know, they have barely any discernible language, no housing or land cultivation. This cemetery, then, seems to be the only progress towards any culture more significant than the animal kingdom. The deity they worship then most likely represents a kind of all-purpose god of harvest, death, and birth. It is a curious image, and one wonders whether the stonework was carved by the pigs themselves, or perhaps the earlier more intelligent species of travelers who allegedly came to this planet some millennia ago. It is a kind of monstrous thing, comprised of multiple arms and braids, like a galaxy, with one central eyeball gazing from the center of the monstrous sculpture. We could compose no rational noun for this deity, as their primitive pre-lingual system of grunts is vastly inferior even to primitive man. Their series of pig-like grunts unk thunk lago and frukur quite possible don't mean anything at all beyond stimulated emotional cries. Nonetheless, Unk Lagal was thrown around frequently in the presence of the statue of their hideous deity, so that Martian scholars have begun to use that term as a general description. After filming their festivities, some of the Gamora tribes became unruly and had to be subdued and chemically sterilized. We became weary of the incidents and returned to base camp in order to update, back up, and analyze our discoveries in the Books of Light. After an incident on Fraction 29, when a crew of scientists examining the hexatinct formations at the mouth of the local caves were subsequently attacked, unprovoked by the pig natives. Our soldiers were forced to cull an entire tribe. We burnt the bodies to prevent any similar showdown at the alien cemetery. Some members of other tribes did come to survey the immense bonfires, 
but as they were fairly segregated and unsociable communities, little discord came of the matter. I must say, as I record my journal at this early stage of the expedition, I feel largely underwhelmed. The unimpressive culture of the pigmen, giving us little worth in study, is extremely disheartening. This entire expedition is looking like it may turn into a simple mining expedition, extracting the rare green crystal from the caves. The other commanders are currently negotiating whether we ask the second fleet to turn back, and the planet declared Terra Nullius's with no intelligent species to be reported in habitat. Further missions to trace the intelligent species of space travelers who already landed here seems like a more worthwhile humanitarian end, and I may ask to be transferred on the Alexanderine as it heads back to the Triangulum Supply Station. There was something about visiting the Tomb of the Aliens which left one with the most unbearable ennui and sense of existential futility. Not because of the fear of their primitive superstitions, but merely the callous nature of the universe and this confirmation of Newton's law of thermodynamics. Death comes to all the creatures in this universe and never appeared as morose and dismal as it did upon this inhospitable planet. Since viewing the odd alien cemetery, many of the scholars have developed all number of mental malady some driven utterly mad by the hopelessness of being stranded on a foreign planet and so touched by the fragility of life. The decomposition process seems marginally suspended on Gamor 5 and possibly has to do with the strange atmosphere. For the skeletons and corpses laying in the square holes seemed preserved by time, except for the ones who had been devoured by the enormous slithering worms. Valdegrath Journal 329 megapascals, star pattern V2ZX, fraction 38. My request to be transferred has been granted. The events of fraction 35 were perhaps all I could handle. There had been a party of soldiers sent out to the methane lakes in the northern regions of Infantamara. Reports came back from Lieutenant Sharp that a group of marines escorting the scientists had been ambushed by the Gamora pigs. Seven slain in more senseless violence, the primitive degenerates have showed that they are totally incapable of empathy and intellect. The more aggressive tribes are likely to be napalmed by three soul. Excavation of the caves has already begun, and the whole fleet is hoping to be done with this miserable planet in no less than twenty soul. I depart on the Alexander Wormley at half fraction tomorrow. It is my understanding the Alexander Rafui will be leaving in five Sol. They will be taking some local specimens for detailed analysis, and the carving of the strange Gamoran god will also be taken aboard the ship. Dismal though it is, the Unk Laga artifact is the only thing the Martians at home will find remotely interesting from this barren hellhole of a garbage water planet. Valdegrath Journal 329 megapascals, star pattern V2ZX, Mars Sol 289. Though I am now safely aboard the Alexander Boehm, heading home to Mars, an unshakable dread seems to linger perpetually in the forefront of my mind. Gamora 5 has left its uncleansable stain on me, and those vile pig beasts and their contemptible culture has left me with little hope for intelligent life in our universe. All life is sparse, fevered, weary, and difficult. Humanity's most insane idea was that it was ever worth exploring the outer reaches of space. We should have looked into that abysmal darkness and seen it for what it was, a cold, empty void through which a colonial mindset could only hope to inject that coldness into man's own culture. We are infected with the bleakness of space now. Then... There is the events that occurred on the Alexander Foy craft. These only serve to rapidly intensify my cosmic terror and sense of the absurdity of existence. It was that blasted stone sculpture, the Pigmen Deity. It must have had some contamination from the open graves, diseases we have never even fathomed. How foolish our scientists were not to even quarantine the hideous sculpture. We received video logs from within hours of the vessel's departure. The crew had observed that strange photosynthetic growth, half plant, half organic, which had begun to grow upon the ship's hull like a vine. 
The foreign fungus was all originating from the grotesque sculpture of Unklaga, vertebrae and formations of rib cages, plant-like veins and living tissue, hands and fingers. The crew had tried to contain the growth by burning it, but each purge only brought the growth back in stronger contingents. It worked its way over three different decks, but it was the engine room where the unique vagina growth seemed to be particular intense. Pink and purple folds of skin, those conical horns, then in the center of it all, one hideous yellow eyeball. Whatever it was. It subverted the mechanics and computing of Alexander Wand, sealed the doors, locked off the crew, we only received fragments of the videos of what really occurred out there. Soldiers becoming vegetable growths, their spleens and livers devoured by their own peers. Scientists' intestines and anatomy merging with that terrible cellular growth, that cancerous organism. So many pointless casualties. And for what? To find nothing but contagion in the buttfuck corner of the universe, for no avail to mankind. When I return to Mars, I shall quit the service and return to a simple life of farming, though it will serve little purpose to tell much more on the matter of my ancestor Alderon Valdegrath, for the Valdegrath family has indeed, since this account, lived a relatively obscure life of pastoral simplicity. My own trade, I, Ernest Valdegrath, have made my way as a scientist, achieving simple acclaims here at home, and resolving duties of domestic responsibility. Martians should learn to care for Martians before we attempt to impose our failed morality on other organisms around the solar system. But I must report my findings to the Republic, for I fear there is much more in my great-great-grandfather's account than appears on the surface. As we now have greater access to the Triangulum Galaxy and have observed a larger number of terrestrial plant life from that region, we now can near identify the organism or near thereof, which probably infected the crew of the Alexander before. It seems likely the ship was infected by a strain of Halfergas Asteria, a highly contagious cellular malformation which travels through hoxic and carbon-based life forms and inorganic material alike. Obviously, when left to its full capacity, the organism will utterly decimate everything it comes in contact with. However, with microscopic observation, I have also concluded that many strains of Asteria will lay dormant in the blood cells of animal life, carrying genetically from generation to generation through DNA. The probability that the Asteria contagion infecting every Martian who set foot on Gamor 5 is not only likely but a guaranteed event, coupled with the knowledge of the rapidity which the disease is able to spread. I believe that likely all of Mars will be infected with the dormant cellular malformations caused by the contagion. In fact, with millions of Martians traveling to Earth every quinter soul, Earth, too, will now undoubtedly have a cellular infection rate of 70, 80 percent of its population. The current science suggests these odd carrier cells may even be cross-generational, though there is no way to measure it now save digging up our earthly ancestors' corpses. But the cellular malformation could travel across time through our DNA, infecting our species right back until our evolutionary inception as lowly simian beings, whatever this could possibly mean. Whilst no conclusions can be drawn at this stage precisely whether the dormant and thus benign contagion can have demonstrative effects of mutation on infected organisms, it is my assertion that no expense should be spared in researching the full gravity of this event, even if we must now unearth the tomb of every dead human being on planet Earth. 